I've read books about people that have done it and and seen people, you know, in, in different like Sports Illustrated magazines uh, for quite some time now. And, you know, when I first heard about it, I thought they were crazy. And it was kind of one of those things where it's just like, is that really possible? You know, how could I ever do something like that? Yeah, so we're outside of uh, Culver's right now. We just stopped to grab something to eat. We're in Mostar, Wisconsin, and we're on the way to the Kettle 100 to do the a hundred mile run solo with about 200 other participants in Kettle Moraine State Park which is about two hours from here. We are on our way trying to get there by 7 p.m. so that I can get the packet pick up, picked up tonight so that we're ready for the race that starts at 6 a.m. tomorrow. You know, coming into the race that first morning, a lot of people around, a lot of excitement. You know, a lot of people not built like me, meaning they're, you know, most long distance ultra runners are skinny and uh, not big and muscular, 6'3 and 230 pounds. And so maybe even a little question of, man, should I really be here? Should I be doing this? There's a lot of unknown because I'd never, I'd never attempted anything like this. Like, um, you know, the furthest I had ran up to this point was 50k, and uh, this was going to be over 150k. And so, yeah, there's a lot of unknown, unknown as far as like, do I have what it takes? Is my body going to hold up? I saw you and, and Rhett at mile 15 at, at the first major aid station, and then I didn't see you guys again until right around mile 30. It was kind of in between there where, where I realized that I was basically the last runner out on the course. Um, just been trying to go really slow trying to save myself for tonight it's kind of hard because I am the last one evidently which is which is all good but uh, my pace has actually been picked up here lately it's been it was kind of nice and flat for the last three four miles probably but just trying to really stay on top of my nutrition. And like I said, just, just not, not burn myself out. So, so far so good. And that was one of the other things. Yes, I was the last on the course and I went a long time without seeing people, but I did start to slowly catch up to people because I was just going slow and steady. I had stuck to my plan, like I said, and I was just going and moving and just never stopping. And I started to slowly pass a few people and uh, you know, it starts to lift the spirits up a little bit. Music bed. At mile 63 or at 6.30 p.m., whichever comes first, they allow you to have pacers that come out on the course with you to help you through the, the last part of the race. So it was that point at mile 47 for me um, where I was able to meet up with Jake and Rhett and uh, Pete, the other pacers, um, for the last part of the race and realized that I was really only at mile 47, but my watch said I was at mile 51, and also that I was, you know, closer to a 16:40 to 17-minute mile pace at the time, and my watch was telling me like that I was doing 13-minute miles at, in some parts, and so it was really at that point was kind of maybe one of the lowest points because I knew I still had half of a race to go, uh, 50 miles plus to go. Uh, my watch was lying to me the entire time, which, which told me I wasn't doing as well as I thought I was. And so it allowed, uh, if, I, if I really let it, it was an opportunity to really let some doubts come in. Like, man, I, I don't have what it takes. I'm not going to make it. Um, it was when dark was just setting in, which is also an opportunity for doubt to kind of creep in. You start to get tired. It's hard to see. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that really saved me, or one of the biggest lessons that I got from, from the Kettle 100 was that we, 
what we focus on we feel and it, it's so just a way of saying that a lot of times we choose to focus on the wrong things we choose to focus on the pain or the hurt or how hard it is or how much work we have to do or in my case how many more miles I had to go yet and when we start to do that that's when you start to doubt yourself and that's when people start to quit Um, I was doing great. Uh, I was sticking to the plan. I was going at a pace that was going to allow me to finish. I was feeling good. And uh, we came into, we finished the 100K, which is 60, uh, right, right around 63 miles. And um, I had three pacers with me, and all of us thought that, that I was doing good, that I was on track. Um, we had 30 hours to finish 100 miles, and my pace had me coming in ahead of that time at that point. I still had some left in the tank, and uh, as I was leaving the aid station uh, to go back out and, and run the next leg, uh, one of the event organizers stopped me and said, hey, uh, you, missed, you missed the cutoff time. Um, Everybody's saying it's delicious though. We were at 18 hours and 40 minutes when I left the aid station and they said no runners uh, were allowed to go back out until uh, after 18 hours. And we didn't know that, we didn't, we didn't realize that that was the cutoff, we just thought that if we were under an 18 minute mile pace, which would get you 100 miles in 30 hours, uh, that we would be okay. And uh, actually that wasn't the case, you had to be out of that aid station in under, or just under 18 hours. We were already talking about finishing. We were on that eight miles together. We were talking about who, who was going to be the pacer when we finished. And in my mind, I, I had already finished. I just had to actually, you know, complete the miles. Like, so we, I really had no one to blame but myself. And so it was just a lot of disappointment. I had a lot of friends and people and family watching and supporting and pulling for me. Uh, telling people that I was going to go do this and, and now to have to come back and own up to that, own up to the mistake. And, uh, you know, we teach the men and women that come through our programs all the time that details matter. And uh, when it came down to myself and my life and, and this event and having, you know, friends flying from Arizona and, and from Utah to help and I wasn't prepared, um, that hurts. And so, yeah, in that moment, when we're back at the tent and the race director's talking to us and, and the realization that it's over is hitting, it's just a lot of, you know, disappointment in, in, in myself um, more than anything for allowing that to happen when I'd done everything else right up until that point. Like I paced myself so that I had enough to finish. I had truly taken care of my nutrition so that I wouldn't bonk out and not be able to go because I didn't properly fuel my body throughout this race. And I had done all of those things. I had all the gear, all the equipment that I needed. I had great support. And the only thing that I didn't do was something that was very avoidable, which was you know, making sure I knew what the cutoff time was so that I could be there in time and get out and finish the race.